Welcome to the White Sniper. I am Charlie Story, aka the Sniper Chief. Come with me on the ultimate journey to the best possible repertoire you can have with one G3. There we are, we're about to start disc one. And uh, there's something about disc one you need to more know. It can morph into different ECO codes, as you probably know. There's all sorts of morphing going on with the white sniper. Sometimes you can see it, where it's coming from. Sometimes you can't. It's just hard. It's new. So let's get ready to tell you what's going on with this one. We've got the reverse classical dragon. Very important. Lots of different reverse dragons can go on. A reverse closer cilium. In section 3 we've got a, a reversed close Sicilian Rosalimo. In section 4 we've got a reversed C3 Sicilian. Whoa, ho, ho. where's he going? Where's the sniper gone again? If and how you see him there and he's gone again. What about section 5? A reverse close Sicilian versus a white sniper bot the next setup. Oh yeah. This is not white sniper bot and you're going to be hearing a lot about that. That's an easy way to keep your small edge. Section 6, Reverse Close Sicilian. Guess what? Again, we're going to see another White Sniper bot the next setup. So, get ready to master, to grandmaster the White Sniper bot the next setup. Now, as you know, I've expected everybody who's gotten to this stage so far in their sniper development to have read the Sniper Everyman Chess book, which was published in 2011. I expect you to have seen the, the Sniper Master Pack, which is for black, and I also expect you to have seen the Foxy Opening DVD introduction on the White Sniper, followed by looking at a lot of the elite sniper practitioners uh, games and the diagrams from moves 4 to 20 of nearly all of the games in the white sniper manual book all of these are of course are available from charliechess.com and I expect you to have absorbed all of that information and if you've done that then you're now ready to uh, absorb an excellent opening repertoire called the white sniper uh, now this DVD video is geared towards persons who have read and absorbed all of those materials if you haven't put this down uh, go and get those materials learn that stuff first because that stuff is pretty much uh, very important before you can master this element of the white sniper so I'm going to be gearing it towards people who have understood that stuff and I'll not be repeating much of the thing, the materials and uh, important chess snippets that are required to be the pushing on to master level. So uh, here we go. Uh, this game is going to uh, look at Markowski versus Skembris, which I've already done in the uh, Foxy DVD introduction, but I'm just going to fly through the game and come back and talk about some more points. So here's just flying through the game. Uh, obviously we're going to be looking at G3 move order. Uh, as you can see here, it wasn't a pure sniper. And because it's not a pure sniper, we're going to discuss that a bit later on as well, as to what the different first three moves are. And I'm just going to hyper turbo through this game, which was our great practitioner Markowski defeating Skembris uh, and just because I don't want too much duplication here it's just to remind you that uh, Markowski played a decent game and he won with this opening but there were some improvements for both sides and I'm going to go back and I'm going to have a look a bit, little bit of a look at that if you recall in this game he got round the back and eventually got into the Black King all from a little bite and that's the entire idea of the white sniper you get a tiny tiny an, ed, an advantage which is smaller than a small advantage and you keep that for a while and then eventually you get a, a small advantage and then you try and convert that small advantage in the end game that's the whole 
idea of the white sniper. It's not going for a quick checkmate, it's not going for a quick attack, it's going for a small positional advantage all of the way. So let's go back to some key points of this game. First of all, G3. Uh, Markowski prefers this to get into a white sniper rather than the C4 route, and that's what I'm pushing throughout the whole of this tape. Uh, and then if the C4, Markowski plays C4, and with good reason, he doesn't like to allow pawn to D5, allowing black to get a quick big center, and then going for a Bononi setup. Although well, there's nothing wrong with that setup as far as white's concerned. This is a preference for Markowski, he prefers not to allow it. After knight f6, black is putting a fair bit of pressure on the centre, fair enough. And now he's trying to get a space advantage in the centre. Now, according to our story pawn scale, white should be really happy here, uh, and rightly so. Uh, white can look forward to using this extra pawn on d2 at some point later in the middle game or even in the end game. Or even in the opening we're not bothered as long as when it happens uh, we're going to have some tangible small advantage using that extra pawn uh, to what to black's advantage here he's developed his knight uh, it's on a decent square now far better than its initial square where it was at f6 um, if i just take that back and move here just to be quite uh, uh, thorough if black instead instead of taking the pawn try to gamble with pawn to c6 not exactly working at this point because after d takes c6, knight takes c6, uh, black doesn't quite have enough for the pawn. White can get a small advantage and I'll just take you through what I consider to be the best moves using my engines and my own intuition. After knight f3, bishop c5, uh, black has some lead and development but it's not quite enough to justify the extra central pawn that white has and we'll see why. Uh, natural development uh, white is quite stable and you can start simplifying some pieces and there is just this very strong pawn at uh, d3 that's a huge advantage and that's enough for a small advantage so I'll just take you back that was the c6 possibility for black it doesn't work so don't be afraid of it if somebody tries to try and blow your white sniper away so taking it back to after uh, 4 c takes d5 and knight takes d5 uh, we're going to have a look here, uh, I just want to quickly mention pawn to b3, intending bishop to b2. So after pawn to b3, uh, the idea here is, for example, after knight to c6, bishop to b2, um, the idea is for white to put some pressure on the e5 pawn and try and force f6. And if that happens... Uh, for example, here if black uh, um, plays bishop e7 first, white has the option of playing pawn to d3 and if castles then knight to f3, which then sets a bit of a problem for black as to how to defend this e5 pawn. Uh, and probably one of the better ways to defend it is with f6. But what this does is it weakens this diagonal and it does allow some potential counterplay in the future for white and you'll notice that the pawn structure here this is one of the the favorite setups and pawn structures that are, re are recommended it's very solid and although the position is level it's very solid for white and he has good prospects of using this extra central pawn in the future i recently had a game uh, against uh, a 2100 called Roger Cawthorpe who uh, uh, I after completing the research on the white sniper I used this setup and it resulted in a good positional win for white um, and uh, it's thoroughly recommended because Roger is he's a good positional player uh, and it is very important that um, the test of the white sniper when you're white you can keep a very good small positional advantage even against good positional players so um, moving back to uh, the start of this line that was uh, looking at an early b3 trying to pressurize this e5 pawn if i take it back a bit further back to knight takes d5 um, my good feeling is a good strong move here for black is 
correction for white is knight to c3. This seemed to hit the, mo the main target core principles, develops a piece, puts pressure on this piece in the center. And then if knight takes c3, the story pawn scale here, bc3, the extra uh, pawn from the knight's file to the bishop's file, does give white a very long-term tiny advantage. And this is definitely a useful advantage. So uh, this um, would definitely offer some advantage. So if we just go back, rather after knight to c3, so if I'm just moving forward, this was the position, white plays knight c3, here it comes again, knight to c3. At this point, knight c3, clear small advantage for white, perhaps better for black is to play knight b6. And then, although this has violated a principle, it's moved once, twice, three times, and white is getting a lead in development, and he's got the extra central pawn, isn't entirely obvious how white gets the small edge. Uh, you play some good natural moves like this. Now, my good feeling is that you a4 probably doesn't work here. But if you just have a look at one little variation, that's a bit dynamic, where we play a4 with e5, uh, and get an isolated queen pawn position. White could end, aim for this position and he could try and maybe uh, play for a win, but it just looks completely drawn. So if you're playing a stronger player, you know, really much stronger than you, there's practically no way that black can get any advantage here. It's just a draw. Uh, you know, he's got to draw by perpetual check here. So uh, as far as uh, knight b6 goes, after white has played knight to c3, uh, it looks as though a simple way to draw is to play naturally with knight f3 and get this iqp pawn, push the iqp pawn uh, and simplifies down into a sort of a drawn position. But just uh, taking that back, where where could uh, white try and win if he was trying to win this position after knight b6? Knight f3, classical development leading to a draw. Well here, I think uh, similar to what's up one with the Roger Court up game, you can play b3 followed by bishop to b2 and uh, then d3, knight f3 uh, so let me have a look at that, so b3, bishop b2, d3, knight f3, it's carefully do these in the right order depending on what the response is but generally that is the plan followed by knight e4 which would then release the bishop from b2 on e5 would pressure e5 and we're probably going to get the pawn f6 move which is going in turn to weaken this entire diagonal which is going to give us a little bit of chance for counterplay and then maybe in the future using once that's weakened that diagonal a little bit white can look forward to playing knight h4 bring the knight to e4 maybe playing pawn to g4 putting the knight to f5 and I think that is a good approach of playing and keeping a small positional advantage with potential for getting an all-out attack on the king side at the right moment. Okay, so um, I think that will do now for this particular look at the reversed classical dragon. Okay, so I think next section is going to be reversed close Sicilian slash Grand Prix. Now we're going to have a look at a Grand Prix attack slash close Sicilian reversed setup. Uh, and it's going to come through the G3 move order again. And after G3, E5 c4 so again in this thomas markowski game versus andre shechev um we're going to see that he's played the c4 move again disallowing the central build-up so you stop the central build-up but now black tries to get a central pawn up with a supporting wing pawn the f pawn and here it's quite an ambitious setup for black to try and grab the center and it's interesting to see how Markowski deals with this early uh, attempt at setting up a Grand Prix attack reversed. Of course, having that extra move allows White a whole set of different options and restrictions. 
And let's see how that go works out in this game. After knight c3, knight f6. Now, in a normal Grand Prix attack, you'd expect the black bishop to come out to c5. Uh, however, uh, Markowski plays quite a useful move here to prevent that key, key opportunity to make that bishop live on that beautiful diagonal where it's menacing and attacking the white camp. He plays e3. So clearly, what he's looking for is if bishop c5 is played in the future, he'll just play knight e2 and pawn to d4 and get a tempo and rolling pressure down the centre, which would be good, very good, for white. So knight e2 and d4 would definitely hit whatever bishop comes there and gain some free extra move in the opening. And just one free move in the opening at master level is very important, so he couldn't allow that. So... Uh, we're going to have a look at um, a number of options here for black, other than bishop c5. Um, in this game, we're going to have a look at uh, the fifth move options for black, which are in this position. Bishop to b4, 5, pawn to g6, 5, d5 by black, 5, e4 by black, 5, bishop e7. So... From the top, I'll tell you those again, 5 bishop e4, 5 g6, 5 d5, or 5 e4, 5 bishop e7. So, let's have a look what happens in this position for black if he chooses bishop b4. Uh, now, white cranks on with knight d5, and after castles, knight e2, knight takes d5, pawn takes d5. White has, again, this tiny little bite, and we'll see that after knight e7, castles, pawn d6, d4, again, white has this tiny little bite, it's a tiny bit better in the centre, the bishop on b4 could come into fire later, um, so he's just making sure he doesn't lose that bishop, and transferring it to that useful diagonal, but now white takes in the centre, and after harassing the bishop, he then gets this natural queen b3, with attack against the king, gaining a little bit of initiative in the centre, keeping that tiny bite, and it's this tiny bite that what white wants, that's all he wants, a tiny bite, he wants to get a, convert that to a small edge, keep the small edge, keeping the small edge with possibilities for doing something even, even better, turning into a greater edge. And that's the whole idea of the white sniper, and just about every opening, I'm not going for any big knockout punch, just tiny little jabs, just keeping keeping the very small advantage all of the way. So black tries to hang on to this uh, central pawn, uh, but as you can see, the battery which has been formed here, he has this battery, and it's lining itself up at g7 in the future. So after queen e7, h4, f4, um, Markowski then shifts his attention to the center, and as you can see, he's now got all of his pieces into the game. All pieces are in the game, doing something useful, and they're starting to generate what I call secondary attack. Once they've started doing something use useful, they then do something even more useful. After rook f8 takes this uh, pressure that uh, white could have potentially had on the long diagonal, after knight f4, uh, it's a clear win of the center. Uh, and... Um, after knight f4 here, uh, you can see that uh, white has a very good advantage. Not just uh, an extra pawn, but his pieces are better placed. And this, this, this bishop is going to be involved in some useful attack on here in the near future. So, uh, that was a, an easy way to advantage by white. So, let me take you back a little bit to our start position uh, of what we were looking at so it was 5e3 very nice move um, uh, just trying to get this uh, trying to grab the center from this strong center that black has but it could be overextended and this is white's idea he's going to play a pawn to d4 here he's going to play a pawn to d4 at some point and get some advantage and we've just looked at bishop to b4 and let me just turbo through that again after knight d5 castles knight e2 takes takes 
he simply grabbed the centre uh, in this manner, harassed the bishop a little bit, got some nice initiative with the queen, bat read up, uh, and then, of course, one eye on the centre, kept the centre, quite happy to go into an endgame with an extra pawn in the bag, and that's good enough to go on to win for Morkowski against Brookstern. So, that was bishop e4, knight d5. Now, let me take you back to pawn to e3, and we'll have a look at pawn to g6. After pawn to g6, how is white uh, meant to deal with this e3 sniper setup now? Well, let's have a look uh, at one possibility. So, as you can see, the, this knight on e2 supporting the centre, and white tries the the sniper sacrifice as I, as I coined it in earlier books bishop sacrifices itself for the whole of the team and the idea here is just to get a nice stable end game advantage uh, and here white has a nice lead in development and his lead in development using that useful square on c5 uh, for his pieces will turn out to be some sort of bite in the end game if you have a bite in the end game, it means your opponent doesn't have any counterplay, he's just defending, trying to draw. And here, as you can see, this pawn structure is, it shouldn't be red for strength, it should in fact be red for weakness. So, these are very strong tar targets, and in the end game, uh, White went on to win in Vaulin versus Nestrovich, uh, Vaulin 25-15, and Nestrovich 23-50. And let's just have a look how this end game was won by White. Uh, always be, always keep an eye on what pieces do with regard to the centre in any end game, especially so in sniper end games, because the whole idea is to win the centre, then win the game. So here, uh, this was uh, quite a clever move. B4 check. The presence of tactics when you've got the tiny edge can often present themselves and this is no exception here you can see b4 has gained some great space it sends the king back to b6 otherwise of course knight to c6 check would be lethal so when it goes back and then white just dominates his position in the center that centralized knight will help to go on to win the game let's have a look how the play continues so white has the advantage in terms of the king which is a little bit active black's king which is a little bit active, I'm going to put it red rather than green for strength, because it's susceptible to lots of checks now by these two pieces. These two pieces can create uh, a lot of difficulties for the black king at this point, uh, and this pawn. Remember the three-piece rule, uh, uh, which is here, if I was one, two, three, can often organize a checkmate, or if not a checkmate, real strong threats to uh, get other pieces by using the king uh, in some sort of double attack mechanism to capture other pieces. And this three piece rule around the king means it, it could be in quite a bit of danger. So black tries to alleviate the danger, but white was he's now thinking about uh, swinging his rook over to a3 perhaps, and rook a6 and knight c6. Um, that looks quite a dangerous plan. White now tries to activate his king. Uh, so he's, he was trying to activate his king to e4, and he would have done that with the uh, pawn to g4 and pawn to g5. Black anticipated the pawn coming to g5, but now the king, once again, is in this very weak position. It's very dangerous. For example, if White can get his knight to c5, there's some very clear danger there. Um, White didn't choose that plan. He decided to get his rook to c5 attempt to get his rook to c5 and he did it and now although this king was quite strong it has now uh, turned into a bit of a weakness out there sort of out of the game compared with uh, white's king which is just getting ready to support and pressurize into the center maybe even come down here or even support these pawns as they start coming down uh, knight comes into c6 uh, on this weak square and it's also hitting this very weak pawn and as you can see this little tiny advantage has turned these pieces that should be 
red for weakness again you can see how weak that castle and that pawn is and how restricted that castle has become uh, white has a good advantage he doesn't have to rush and he's just fixing the weakness at h7 so that pawn now is very weak and if white can win that and then possibly win this one as well then these two guys are going to become super strong and just march down and become queens together so let's have a look and see what happens so after rook e7 um the 2350 rated player actually resigned in this position because he could clearly see that there is too many difficulties coming with white about to munch this pawn munch this pawn possibly even munch this pawn and then this one's going to be super weak uh, and these pawns are just going to fly down so he actually resigned and that was pretty 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 good game there so let us just take you back again to this e3 move quick recap we've looked at bishop b4 and we just looked at g6 there let's just fly through the g6 for your memory again just to fly through it so i'm just going to fly through this game it was a sniper sacrifice and the, the knight used the c5 square which was co which is a common theme in any knight c6 c6 sniper sacrifice situation and then all white wanted was a little bite in the center in the end game that's all we're happy to have the sniper practitioner it could be a draw we don't care if it's a draw but we know we're going to have all of the fun in the end game that's pretty much the idea and that's a very correct way of playing chess so that was that g6 system i'm going to take you back again to the e3 move and we're going to have another look at another option for black here in this Grand Prix setup, which is pawn to d5. Now let me just turbo through this uh, pawn to d5 move first, and then I'll come back and say some stuff on it. So clearly pawn to d5 is a good idea, and um, what can happen when you get a, a move in like d5 all black's pieces could in some instances just flood through the center so white has to be very careful to put up some good pressure against that this is just turbo through the game to show you how white actually won this game okay right and I'm going to take you back now back to the start of this which is 5d5 so what we're looking at here is after 5d5 big attempt at black to liberate all of his opening uh, player but in doing so uh, obviously he's violated the principal moon he's piece twice there white uh, although he's going to win this d5 pawn back and he does do so white does have this extra pawn at d3 again he still has the extra central pawn and now the question is is this weak or is it strong this pawn setup it's hard to say uh, and as you can see after rook a d8 that this uh, this pressure on the d3 pawn is quite nasty but knight e4 looks as though it has uh, allowed black to be a pawn down and if black's a pawn down and this pawn structure which is shouldn't be green of course it should be red because it's super weak you have to make sure that you don't have weak pawns like that uh, as much as possible so it really does devalue the position uh, so it was basically black was a pawn down and there was no real way back in this position uh, to justify the pawn deficit there was a tiny bit of play but not enough to justify the pawn and just taking you back to d5 now just to show a d5 not exactly the grandest of moves there because this little bit of pressure that white got uh, allowed him to basically uh, get, a, get a pawn 
so basically nothing there that pressure on the diagonal with E4 was quite useful so back to D5 just uh, didn't want to spend too much time on that bit we, we're going to have a look back at E3 at the next variation which is quite a critical variation I burned quite a bit of midnight oil to find the solution for this after E4 now this can be a bit dangerous because black is looking to bring this guy here and then that guy there and that's a massive positional advantage with the bonus of attacking that pawn on route so white immediately has to deal with this and the way to deal with it is with a double exclamation mark on this move so this is a very important move you must remember if this situation ever happens so I've done all the hard working and finding it for you uh, and it's if you remember my grenade move uh, in the black sniper that I used to reference was F6 um, sometimes it can just explode the center and ex that's exactly what happens here point to F3 by white and this helps to explode the black center and uh, for example after bishop b4 white will take on e4 and after black's attempted a Rosalie more style effort at damaging the black structure of course we're happy because the story pawn scale is increasing there then it's a simple way for white to play and play knight h3 with the idea of castling and knight f2 with great pressure on this very weak pawn probably backed up with uh, queen c2 at some point winning the pawn with everything that he's got and then once the pawn's won we will just win the center play d4 d5 maybe c5 b4 and that'll give a chance for the bishop to get liberated down there so uh, in a nutshell i better take you back to that f3 move there it is i'll take you a step out further back so you can see it pawn to f3 excellent move which enables why to keep the advantage against this very clever f5 setup with e4 okay so we've looked at bishop e4 we've looked at 5g6 5d5 5e4 and finally we're going to have a look at 5 bishop e7 which uh, was the game markowski versus andrei shekachev i'm just going to fly through it uh, after bishop e7 white just plays um uh, quite calmly here with d3 uh, which is an interesting way of playing but I think I covered this on the, the foxy introduction so rather than go through the game in fact I will, I'll just turbo through it and I'll come back to seven castles in fact no I'll do it another way I'm going to play rather than seven after seven d3 which was the main line I just want to quickly show you seven castles which is a bit of my own analysis and then after say b6 e4 gram in the center e4 again we see this great move f3 uh, and it's resembling a bit of a french structure but a french with an extra tempo and this uh, really does allow white to get a nice little small edge remember that's all i'm after just a very nice small edge with no counterplay for black and there you go that's seven castles so i'll take you back there to show you seven castles again seven castles there now but back to this game which i'm going to turbo through as this was on the uh, introduction in the in the foxy dvd after d pawn to d3 this was the markowski markowski versus shekachev both 2500s and of course markowski is our uh, very honored practitioner of the white sniper and then after d6 i'm just going to turbo through how markowski beat shekachev Shek here in this position so he just played nice little central pressure with queenside pressure very happy to allow a little bit of attack on the white king if he wants it he won that pawn and then the, his opponent the 2500 strength player couldn't handle the the pressure of the rooks and the pressure on the c7 pawn and actually resigned in this position so that was uh that was that so what have we covered here we have covered after 5e3 against the grand prix attack we know that white can get pretty much a small advantage against anything and it's a small advantage that can realistically convert into something even better so let's have a look how we got to the 5e3 position again then i think i've proven 5e3 is good so back from the top markowski 
I'm just happy to play this move order. That's your initial Grand Prix attack reversed position. Uh, and the idea of playing this um, move here, the next move by white, e3, is to really fight against the bishop coming to c5. Uh, so I've showed you uh, some all of the alternatives other than bishop c5. And if bishop c5 is played, then it's quite simple. You're just going for a knight e2 and d4, getting initiative against the piece, getting a free tempo on development, which is definitely going to keep a small advantage. So that is uh, the end of the reverse closed Sicilian slash Grand Prix with e3, which dissuades bishop c5. Game 3 on this disc is going to be the reversed close Sicilian Rosalimo. So let's get ready to have a look at that. Okay, here we are at game three on disc one, and I would like to have a look at a reversed Rosalimo. So, 1g3, the best move. I believe at this point in my career, 1g3 is the best move I can play. I'll go into that in a bit more detail later, but for now, that's my opinion. After g3, e5, c4. We're currently following Thomas Markowski versus Cesar Alvarado. That's a 25-60 versus a 2200. So you would expect White to win anyway. But let's have a look how the 2200 is disposed of, basically. Now, here we have our uh, Rosalimo, reversed Rosalimo setup, shall we say. Um, the knight's on c6, so you could actually call this a closed Sicilian Rosalimo, if you wanted to be particularly accurate. Um, now here, this is a key move and a key feature uh, in white knight positions. Knight d5 is played, uh, and obviously this breaks the first guiding principle, which is moving the same piece twice without fantastic reason. But there is a fantastic reason. You're going to get some pressure back on this b4 piece, and white would be quite happy to take that off, and then Fiancetto on the queen side have the two bishop advantage and make that work later no problems with that if black does if black allows that so we're going to have a look at what happens after knight takes d5 pawn takes d5 and knight to e7 uh, but before we look at knight e7 i'm just going to turbo through that i want you to have a look at the alternative here which was knight to d4 now it's quite clever here the, this was a game we're following now between a Volin and a Paz Paz Tor. Paz Tor it was a 2250 rated player uh, and Volin here uh, also an excellent elite practitioner he played e3 uh, now if knight to b5 queen to a4 seems to win a piece so where to put the knight okay the knight pops to f5 uh, and as you can see, there's a beautiful move here for white, and this is a very, very good easy point against a 2250 opponent. So it's surprising that such a strong player who's 2250 could fall for such a tactic. You've probably seen it, here it comes. Queen to g4 with a pretty nasty double attack, and game over. So although I've told you that the whole idea of the white sniper is to get a tiny edge for ages, and then a small edge, uh, and then just look for opportunities from the small edge and maybe get into situations for an all-out attack here it's an actually an eight game miniature eight move miniature so let me take you back and show you this miniature again we're going to be looking at knight e7 but in this game it was knight d4 went e3 knight f5 queen g4 so taking you back before knight d4 uh we're going to have a look at knight e7 i'm just going to turbo through this game very quickly just to show you how Markowski beat a 2200 with it. He played knight f3, got some initiative onto the pawn on e5. Black thought he could defend it. He's now violated quite a few principles with moving this piece. He's moved it once, twice, three times. And White gets a chance to exploit that by getting a slight lead in development. And that development, 
because of this this was a dubious move pawn to e4 white can immediately uh, push his knight into g5 to attack this pawn on e4 black tries to defend it but there's a nasty tactic waiting in the win win in the wings which allows white to win quite easily and the clever move here is d6 and as you can see by my green arrows we have a simple a smothered mate checkmating procedure in the wings queen b3 check and white has just won a very clear exchange uh, and all black has to show for it is a pawn and that's not going to be enough in this position there's no other dynamics to justify having a one pawn deficit and we'll just see how Markowski finished him off very quickly I'm just going to really turbo through this to show you quite quickly how it was won so there you go there's an interesting uh, attempt by black to play a reversed Rosalimo but really backfired in the couple of games I've showed you there and that's a great skeleton for you and further investigations if you want to to play it so uh, reversed Rosalimo was uh, bishop to b4 but this was the reverse Rosalimo with the knight on c6 uh, and then the knight jumped straight into d5 it was captured we saw that knight d4 was not very good because it lost a piece and then we saw that knight e7 uh, allowed white to get quite a bit of initiative small advantage in the center which converted to a quick material gain and black was never even in with a shout very depressing days performance by black there and that's the idea of the white sniper just going to make it super super uh, difficult for black to get any sort of active counterplay it's a very annoying system to play against okay um, and that is concluding our game three which was the uh, reversed close Sicilian slash Rosalimo Next we're going to have a look at the reversed C3 Sicilian. And here we are on section 4 and we're going to have a look at the reversed C3 Sicilian. Also known as the Keres system. But it's better to just keep it, try and describe it as to what it is. To avoid confusion, make it clearer, especially for our understanding and juniors is understanding so uh, g3 b5 c4 knight f6 bishop g2 pawn to c6 so as you can see it's a sort of a reverse c3 sicilian against what would be a sort of dragon setup uh, and we're going to have a look uh, at two moves here one move which i'm going to strongly recommend and the other move by our brilliant tactician, sorry, sorry, our brilliant practitioner, uh, Thomas Markowski. So I'm going to quickly look at Markowski's move, and then I'm going to come back and show you my recommendation, which I think is slightly better than D4 in terms of when it has to, uh, when people are checking with computer engines and so on, as they will do eventually at, at top master level. So D4 by Markowski I think knight f3 is better here uh, hence the green I put on there for strength but we're going to have a look at d4 and quickly blast through Markowski's win against the 2342 a chap called Wolfram Hennig so after bishop b4 check which is slightly dubious move I'll just turbo through how Markowski won against bishop b4 check he simply got a symmetrical position but was allowed to get a slight lead in development on the having the, the d-file and then he, he managed to pressurize the queen side and pressurizing the queen side as he's done there with this knight which has been on quite a journey by the way if you just think where that knight's come from uh, and when it gets to that square surprisingly on the on the rim there hitting those weak pawns and allowed white later to get a useful tactic in terms of this sacrifice and this sacrifice uh, to gain one point of material allowed white to go on to win the game but there was a couple of problems there that was played by uh, black you know just allowing some stuff to happen there uh, and immediately let's take you back to bishop to b4 
that was a slightly weak move by Black. So let's take that back and let's have a look if somebody was preparing against you using computer engines. They're probably going to come up with either ETX D4 or Pawn D6. So let's have a quick look at ETX D4, Queen takes D4, uh, and then uh, a useful move by Black here, Knight A6, Knight F3. And white can get a small edge in this position. It's very small, uh, and that's that's you could argue that's what you want. That's what we want. Fair enough. Uh, it's a small edge white there. But what about instead of knight a6? What if uh, instead of knight a6, black plays d5? Quite a natural looking move. And then after knight f3, black has a fair few choices here. He's got d takes c4, bishop e7, bishop to b4, or bishop e6. Uh, we're going to look at bishop e6. I'm just going to quickly uh, fly through this game a bit. And you're going to see that it's a nice little queen pawn position. And black has pretty good command in the centre here. If he has good command in the centre and the IQP pawn position, then he's going to have reasonable chances to defend or even maybe even get some sort of small edge. So... Um, I guess what I'm saying was uh, it was probably quite level there, even though black went on to lose this game. Um, it was actually uh, Tony Koston defeated Shek Chekhov, whose game we saw earlier. But I, I wasn't convinced by that at all. Uh, I think uh, we should take that back and we should try and find a better solution. And I think the best, the better solution is to keep a very good small edge. Knight f3. After knight f3, uh, this pawn is clearly under pressure on e5. So e4, knight d4, and after d5 takes, and if queen takes, there's a clever move here by white, uh, pawn to e3. And what that allows is it allows white a quick opportunity to go for this pawn on e4. For example, after bishop g4, start hitting the e pawn, hitting the queen and the e pawn, and queen b1 allows us to keep hitting the e pawn and makes this knight on b4 look not so clever. And then if black tries anything funky there to try not to lose the e pawn, white simply gets a very nice end game, which he should be able to go on to win. So, uh, my recommendation over d4, which isn't totally bad, but you should have a couple of uh, possibilities to confuse opponents, don't be too easy to prepare for. Uh, so, there's two good options, d4 or my recommendation of knight f3. Uh, keeping the very small edge that way and possibly even win that e-pawn if he tries to push it on. So, uh, that's... I just wanted to quickly show you that on the reversed C3 Sicilian. Next we're going to have a look at the closed Sicilian, the reverse closed Sicilian, so versus uh, a white sniper Botvinnik setup. I'm glad to include a game here from Gary Kasparov, uh, my favourite chess player and arguably the best chess player that's ever lived and is currently living. You know, I, I personally believe if he made a comeback he'd still be the best in the world. So uh, I am going to, um, we're going to have a look at the close Sicilian versus a white sniper Botvinnik setup. Now the white sniper Botvinnik setup is a Botvinnik setup. I'm sure you all know what that is by now, which is, there it is. That's what it is, maybe with knight e2, you could also have it with knight g e2. Now, this white sniper Botvinnik setup can be played against nearly any system that, or any setup that black chooses against a white sniper, except, or specifically in the following instance. Any instance except, and this is a good rule of thumb, you can play this setup, even with a knight on e2, against every system, except if this bishop has come to c5, because obviously 
this diagonal would be very useful for black and also my analysis suggests that if this black pawn is on c5 if the pawn comes to c5 with pressure on d4 there if he has pressure on d4 there then again well that's drawish uh, it's very drawish if black gets that pawn to c5 against a white snake or botvinnik setup but in this tape you'll see a lot of botvinnik setups where that hasn't been played by black and it just gives a very small advantage minimal counterplay for black and more often than not white just goes on to convert the win and black's had a very dour uh, attempt at any sort of counterplay because the solidness of the structure with support from the f4 pawn at some point or even the b4 pawn to b5 creates such a difficult challenge for black that white is having all of the fun so Gary Kasparov versus Elizabeth P. Pyatz. Elizabeth is 23.49 and I just want to turbo through this game first of all and see how Kasparov won it. It was quite odd in this game that he allowed his king to move but he, by the time the king got the initiative back on the knight he had just artificially castled and he had all the pressure. However uh, in this particular game he did allow, Kasparov did allow a little bit of counterplay and it was by no means easy how he he should have easily won this but uh, he did allow a little few snippets of counterplay for Elizabeth in this game uh, but he shouldn't have allowed it shouldn't have been allowed shall I say so I guess what I'm saying is uh, this setup the white snipe by Botvinnik setup is very good for white I'm just going to take you back to a key moment in this game uh, in this Kasparov game uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll take you actually a bit further back, all the way back to uh, almost the white snipe by Botvinnik set up a position. Normally it would have the knight on e2, but yeah, Elizabeth fought, played knight d4 early, uh, and then the sniper position, the sniper Botvinnik system set up against any black system was then in place. Uh, Elizabeth managed to stop him from castling, but he castled like so and I just want to show you a couple of things here h5 is being played which can create a whole load of difficulties for black because obviously this rook can suddenly come into play on the h file so black must deal with that probably by castling queenside which happened uh, and then Kasparov tried to rip open the black king opposite side castling who gets there first Elizabeth uh, gambled a little bit by uh, trying to rip open the black king but at the cost of uh, pressure uh, basically the f pawn is no longer pressurizing the center to some extent uh, here Kasparov used a little bit of uh, initiative to uh, fix the king side such that the rooks cannot just come barging down down the g file Sparov got ready to pressurize and he also then got ready to defend his king. He's getting ready to rip open the black king with a6. Elizabeth uh, attempts to prevent the king side from correction, the queen side from being opened. Kasparov hasn't opened the king side, but he has managed to achieve a great square at b7 for the white queen, should it ever get there. And Kasparov definitely had a small advantage here. However, uh, he did go wrong a bit here. Uh, after a pawn to d5, he played king to h1. Here. Uh, he could have simply kept the advantage with queen to e2. And that would be uh, an excellent way of winning the game. Uh, this would have been a simple way for white to have maintained a great advantage and then ultimately went on to win. Um, of course, uh, Kasparov still won this game. Uh, obviously, White had all the fun, basically. However, I just wanted to take you back. Let me just take you back a little bit here. Uh, I want to take you back to uh, the E4 position here. 
So that was our uh, white sniper Botvinnik, as I've coined it, because it can be played in many setups that Black may try. Uh, uh, let's just have a quick look at an alternative. What happens if white doesn't want to go for this uh, white sniper Botvinnik? Because I, at this level, you know, it's threatening to be Grand Master level if you're going to be taking this system up. Um, I mean, you can still use it at a sort of lower, under 2200 level, uh, and it would still be effective. But I, I am approaching this tape from the point of view that you're going to be looking to try and get some sort of mastery out of it. So after, rather, so not, you need to be a bit less predictable. So you've got the uh, Bofenik setup possibility, but let's give you another one. So Knight F3 is also a very strong move, obviously developing a piece in the centre, getting the Knight to a great square. Knight F6, likewise. Castle, nice and solid. And now, I guess I just wanted to give you uh, a nice little plan here for white. After castles, rook b1. This rook b1 idea with the idea of b4, it's very annoying for black, it's very good for white, and nearly all positions where it's obvious it should be played. So he's black camps down on it, uh, white gets it in anyway, he's got his b4 moving anyway, and, but he's conceded the a file to black. But that might just be a temporary situation and white might still be able to even seize the a file let's have a look how that goes about that after b5 bishop b2 no rush here uh, and this is one of the great things you need to remember about playing um playing with the white sniper uh, when i first started using it uh, i always wanted to be quite aggressive in attack but what i realized was you've got to play it you still you still got to be aggressive, but very only very tiny bit aggressive. That's the whole secret of it. Tiny little bit of pressure aggression, no big aggression. That's the secret to playing the white sniper successfully. Tiny aggression, not excessive aggression, and you reap your reward in the end game time after time after time. So here, black in turn tries to go aggressive, and here we see what happens: how white gets a small advantage and then converts it into more. And this particular game we're following here is a game by Halkias, rated 2579, versus Vidal, rated 2434, from a, a, great, a game in 2011. So, after Queen B3, again this annoying check, uh, Black tries to defend by playing Bishop B6, but this allows this pressure on the B7 pawn, which gets some a little bit of initiative certainly slows down the black queen kingside attack or kingside assault and now rook, the rook defends the b pawn but at quite a cost the white rook now grabs the a file so black had the a file but he had to relinquish it to defend the pawn now black has to go all out attack now i used to like sort of playing this style of attack when i was younger from the black side but realized the attack just rarely well let's just say it doesn't work against computers it can work against human beings but with good good defense it doesn't actually work in my opinion but it has to be really good defense so uh, here white begins his assault he brings the rook in he's got the queen side pressure he's trying to slow down and create problems so black can't just march all of his king side troops over to the white king so c6 was probably best here, but we're going to play b6. I'm going to come back to have a little look at c6 in the future. Uh, so after b6, just following this game off, just putting the game to bed. After knight to d5, again we see this knight to d5 move. I'm going to put a, a red, uh, sorry, a green for strength. In fact, I'm just going to uh, show you all of the different squares that knight attacks when it comes there, eight squares, eight influential squares. So getting that knight there is very useful and often if a pawn captures it here, like for example c takes d5, that ensures that that pawn becomes useful, obviously controlling some key squares which can lead to other stuff and suppress the black, piece, black pieces further. So after rook c8 he, tries, he decides to leave it there for the time being but this allows black, uh, correction, white to uh, seize the air file 
allows Black the chance to have some attack, but in giving him the opportunity to have this attack, he neglects the center to some extent, and he's certainly given the E4 square, which was uh, utilized immediately. And you can see this E4 square, once Black has committed to this F4 move, once Black has committed to this F4 aggressive move, this knight is now a beautiful tower of strength, dominating and controlling so many useful squares for his both attack and defense should have been needed. It's very important your pieces are flexible enough for attack and defense. So, Black tries this all-out attack mechanism. The problem is speculative attempted all-out attack, uh, and this simply allows uh, a route in for white to play an excellent move himself there's a great move here by white knight takes d6 excellent move with the point being if queen takes d6 bishop to a3 and knight e7 check is coming and black's going to run out of pieces to continue in an attack and then the ruins are just going to be allowed for white to run riot around the ruins of the black position so after knight takes d6 couldn't take it, but now it's looking pretty desperate. So after pawn f3, trying to get rid of white's main defender around his king and offer some potential for attack. Uh, white played this initiative gaining move, obviously. He took a rook and threatened a knight e7. So black desperately tries to mix things up, but it is quite desperate. Uh, and obviously bishop takes d5 might have been an idea but queen takes d5 is a good move temporary sacrifice of the queen because after qd5 97 check would win the queen back uh, so with bishop takes a black hole so resigned so what was that game let's take it back this was knight f3 different to our sniper botvinik setup which i am pushing but i'm also pushing this one as well now you've got two ways of playing against this very solid setup by black that he has here. Uh, it was this rook b1 plan with temporal concession of the a file, but the bishop gets a little bit of initiative on b7, which allowed the a file to pass over to white. Once the a file was passed over, black had to go for all out attack, which left squares behind him. A tactic came about because of control of the center, and it resulted in a very nice win for white without breaking sweat okay so that was that and i think just taking it back before e4 two great options here e4 sniper botvinik or knight f3 uh, playing in a bit more controlled less blocked style mm. That concludes the, that section 5. Uh, we're going to have a look at another snipe white pot for next sec in the next section. So let's get on with that. In chapter 6, or section 6, we're going to look at the reverse close Sicilian. Again, with a white sniper bot for Nick. Um, we're going to look at the popular bishop e6 and queen d7. When I say popular, I mean that would be popular with colours reversed, which would be bishop e3 and queen d2. And it's well known that a, a, a botvinik setup was very good against that. So let's have a look what I'm talking about here. After the reversed Sicilian position that we get into, we get into a reverse close Sicilian. Bishop e6, obviously this would be bishop e3 in the reversed setup. Uh, d3, queen d7. Uh, and there, this is quite useful. For example, if knight f3 here by white, that wouldn't be so good because bishop h3 would be getting rid uh, and getting rid of that beautiful bishop. And I think uh, that would be practically equal in that position, despite white's slight lead in development. So, uh, here... I'm going to have a look at two two games, very similar to the last time. We're going to be looking at a, a Botvinik setup immediately with e4 and then rook b1 again. So let me just go through uh, Markowski versus Warakomsky. 
game just very quickly it was a, a, a white sniper botvinik setup again against this reversed c uh, close sicilian and again the knight comes to d5 f5 now this game was won by markowski but he didn't play very well in it in my opinion let's have a look although he won it there was a very good way for black to get an advantage which we're coming to shortly uh, by the way uh, here markowski played bishop e3 uh, in my opinion b4 was much better after b4 castles b5 just kicking the knight bishop g5 could have been played with advantage or even rook b1 so just taking you just before my recommendation of b4 Markowski obviously he's our elite practitioner he played this in 2007 uh, he played bishop e3 and then after castles queen d2 fair enough uh, black played rook to f7 and this was his error this is the moment I believe Markowski misjudged the position which is very rare I haven't really f th this is one of the few times I've ever found a problem with Markowski's play with the engines uh, and he played e takes f5 we're going to come back later and have a look at the better move which was after rook f7 to play rook a b1 we're going to be coming back and looking at that why that, why that was much better and Markowski would still be better with the white sniper botvinik setup but let's have a look what happened in Markowski's game he played e takes f5 and the problem with this is uh, as you will see after knight takes f5 uh, now this knight is very good on f5 it's you could threaten to exchange something on e3 and white doesn't have any direct compensation with this bishop this bishop is it's not doing anything useful at the moment not directly uh, and black has exchanged a wing pawn for a central pawn there so he's happy with that now after b4 black anticipates the b5 response uh, pawn to c6 and black uh, and this is one of the key plans he ousts the knight on c3 uh, and after d5 black suddenly he's got charge of the centre now I don't want that to happen when you're a white practitioner of the white sniper and this position demonstrates here black would have a small advantage and that's wrong at no point in any of the game should white when you're a white sniper practitioner get a small advantage with black at no point ever so something's gone wrong uh, Markowski dealt with it in the following manner he played bishop c5 black still has a small advantage uh, and black had a small advantage uh, and he sort of blew it there he's got good good grip in the center good pressure and he somehow managed to go on to lose this position uh, it shouldn't have happened but uh, it did so, so I'm gonna take you back uh, I mean Murkowski uh, pulled it out of the fire basically so I'm gonna take you back to uh, just before knight f5 uh, so e f5 here before e takes f5 bad move by Murkowski naughty so let's have a look at my recommendation rather than that rook a b1 uh, and this still keeps the tension in the white sniper buff and you can play e f5 later if it's more uh, suitable um, black can't really play e takes f takes e4 because d takes e4 is nice and strong for white no worries there's potential pressure down the d file with c5 coming as well but more importantly after rook b1 this yellow line represents neither weak nor strength for this bishop now on g7 there's no target on a1 and the queen side pawn storm is coming and all black can do is hope for some king side attack and I can't see the king side attack working especially and the queen side attack is going to gain tangible space and pressure that can result in something very concrete 
any king side attack here is going to be speculative and in my opinion will not work so rook a b1 there is very good in my view i'm not going to look at uh, any particular lines there i'm just showing you the simple plan um if i was going to draw some lines on for black i guess i would say well you can at some point you would like to play f4 which could be dangerous but it's hard to play because at the moment uh, white would just take it and he would quite happily because of all this pressure he should be able to support that and uh, that would just be a clear pawn up so that f4 sacrifice isn't exactly in the in the air plus this knight's going to be driven backwards h6 can't be played because of this sweet battery that white has here uh, so it's not clear obviously black would like to maybe play rook f8 uh, but there's no pressure down the f line and it's still he still cannot play f4 but no f4 so all in all rook b1 good way of keeping the small edge with pressure so that's a very good way of playing it um, okay right so that is as much as I wanted to cover in disc one quick recap we've looked at uh, the reverse Sicilian reversed anti-Sicilians uh, going through 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 chapters one to six chapter one reverse classical dragon chapter two reverse close Sicilian slash Grand Prix well, there was the e3 move chapter three was reverse closed Sicilian Rosalimo remember that was uh, white was going in for knight d5 chapter 4 was a reversed c3 Sicilian uh, where there was two good options for white he could have played d4 Markowski style or my recommendation of 4 knight f3 chapter 5 we began to look at white snipe by Botvinix or playing knight f3 and chapter 6 similarly it, we were looking at white snipe by Botvinix again uh, and that pretty much is almost the conclusion of disc one now again i can't emphasize the importance of you knowing the materials from the sniper book the snipe sniper master pack the uh, foxy opening introduction on the white sniper the white sniper manual and ultimately this uh, um, dvd grand master pack this is uh, a bit more geared towards those that have understood the teaching materials and the variations within those books and also of course I have this sniper monthly update site which is uh, you can look at for three pounds per month and get all of the past uh, monthly updates that I've done in there so you really have to do that to get the most out of these white sniper DVDs and I'm going to uh, almost sign off here for this one uh, and next disc we're going to be looking at is disc 2 which is black occupies the center or uh, white prevents the occupation of the center you can choose either anyway that is the conclusion of disc 1 let's get ready to get on with disc 2